the icons of real estate podcast. Are you ready to learn the proven money-making secrets from top producing icon agents? Ready to skyrocket your business? This podcast is for you. Tune in every week with your host, Tomasz Fonseca, and find out how to implement proven strategies to 10 times your business. From $3 million to $30 million in just 12 months. Brought to you by the Masters in Real Estate Marketing, Arter SEO. Welcome to Icons of Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Patty Teal. Today's guest is Michael Albaum. He has 10 plus years of experience as a real estate investor and as part of his personal portfolio has purchased single family rentals, condos, traditional multifamily, multifamily value add, NN and NNN lease buildings. He is also the host of Roof Stocks Podcast, The Remote Real Estate Investor. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much, Patty. Really excited to be here with you. Oh. I'm so excited because I investigated you, or I should say did research on you. Yeah, this is all work. <laughs> <laughs> and your story sounds so fascinating. So I was going to start the show with you sharing your story, how you started and got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I got my start, I think, like so many real estate investors do by reading the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I did all of the things you were supposed to do. I went to school, went to college, got good grades, got a good engineering job, and then quickly realized I wasn't going to get where I wanted to go fast enough by just my salary alone. So I read that book and spent a couple of years getting self-educated because bigger pockets really wasn't around at that time. Roofstock wasn't quite around at that time. And so I just started piecing it together for myself and ended up buying a single family home in Southern California market that I was fairly familiar with because I'm a California native, grew up there, knew the market. Uh, and I said, okay, this is great. Like the rent check showed up in my inbox the first month. And I'm like, I'm a genius. I'm the first person <laughs> to figure out real estate investing ever, which of course couldn't be further from the truth. But I said, this just makes sense to me from like an objective execution perspective, this works. And so I said, if I could do this once a year for 10 years, that'll be good. I'll have 10 houses. And that was just kind of my arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I started doing. And it dawned on me very quickly that California is a very expensive place to purchase real estate. And it was very mm -hmm. difficult to make the numbers work. So as part of my job, I was traveling around the Northwest US. And I would look at all these various different markets that I found myself in for work and I double dipped. And I was ended up, I ended up buying a lot of properties in where I happened to be for work anyhow. And it was so much cheaper going out of state and the rents were still really strong. So the number kind of ratio that I was looking at is the price to rent. And so I would just buy these properties all over the country that were super cheap. And I thought, I'm a genius. I'm so well diversified. <laughs> you are. <laughs> yeah. Self, self proclaimed, self titled genius. Uh, and so I said, if anything happens in market A, I'm at B through E and vice versa. Well, it just got to be really cumbersome, really top heavy, trying to manage all these different property managers, chasing these people down. So I got some advice go get hyper focused, laser focused on a particular market and watch what happens. It'll blow your mind. And so that's what I did a couple of years ago. I really got laser focused on one particular market and I've just been hammering that market ever since. And the results have been really impactful because now I make one phone call and get updates about numerous properties as opposed to six different phone calls for six different properties. And so I've really kind of carved out a niche for myself. I was doing a lot of multifamily value add stuff, which is basically front of so familiar, buying cheap rundown multifamily properties, making them nicer in terms of physical improvement or putting better management in place. And then either selling, refinancing, or just sitting on the improved cash flow. Wow, that was very clever and a very uh, good description of what you did. So when you say you got laser focused on one area, one physical area or one type of property or both? Yeah, both actually. So it was one physical area, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, to be specific, is really where I got laser focused. And it was that five plus unit multifamily that kind of five to 10 unit multifamily space, because at the time I was buying them really in 2018, there just for whatever reason, wasn't a lot of competition. Multi, that size multifamily was a little bit too big for the mom and pop investors that were doing single family stuff. And it was definitely too small for the institutional investors. So there just weren't a lot of players in the space. And I was able to pick up some really great deals. Wow, so it was just very doable, it sounds like. It was very doable. Now, I'll share with you and your audience, I got way too eager. Eager Beaver had eyes much bigger than my stomach could handle. And so definitely got over my skis 
uh, in terms of how many value add projects I was taking on at once. But one offs individually, absolutely very approachable, very doable. Well, that's great. Now, with these units that were five to 10 unit size, were you getting investors to help you at that point? No. So the majority was just my own capital. I was, um, so I did things kind of opposite of what a lot of folks do. So I was living in the Bay Area when I was working and I was renting the entire time. So I spent about 10 years uh, living in the Bay Area as a renter and was investing in rental properties the whole time. And so I decided that I didn't want to buy a primary residence for myself to live in until I could have my rentals pay for it. And so people are like, wait a minute, you own property, but you don't like, you're still a renter. And I said, yeah, it, it just makes financial sense for me at the time. And so I was scrimping and saving. I had roommates for the entire time I was renting. I even got married and had roommates at the time so we could save money. So we tried to live very frugally and well below our means so that I had tons of extra money to, to pour into investments. You know, I'm really impressed by you to do that. And I've talked to other people who have done that also. Maybe it wasn't their dream life at the time, but they kind of looked a little past what they were going through at that moment to see what was going to happen, you know, five years more down the line to see how profitable it could be. Yes. Yeah, it definitely was less than ideal when my wife and I were in our bedroom and we'd hear our roommates playing music or being loud sure. or whatever. Like, yeah, no one dreams of that lifestyle. But I think it's the, just like you mentioned, the things that come after that, the delayed gratification, that really is what people are searching for and, and hoping to achieve. Yeah. And now you're helping others to take those steps too. How are you doing that? Yeah. So I work as the program manager and head coach at the Roofstock Academy, which is Roofstock's education arm. And we really want to be the one-stop shop for real estate investment education. Whether you're just starting out and have heard about real estate investing, but maybe have never done a deal, all the way up to a more seasoned investor looking to scale a portfolio or get involved with the different asset classes, we've got something for you. Uh, and if we don't, we'll hopefully be able to point you in the right direction. Well, that's good to know. So it could be somebody who's rather seasoned or it could be somebody brand new and they can still plug into your program. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So we've got yeah. pre-recorded self-serve go at your own pace lectures that cover everything soup to nuts. Again, just getting started to some more complicated deal styles and scaling and dispositions. And then we also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so there are likely people that have done what it is you're looking to accomplish that can walk you through and really hold your hand. Here's how you take the theory and put it into practice for your specific situation, which I think is what often is missing. In, in books or other real estate education. It's taking that theory that I learned, but I, for whatever reason, I can't apply it to my own personal situation. Yeah, that's really great because I think, uh, especially for the first, first time investor, man, I would want somebody holding my hand to you know take me through. And I know I'd have a lot of questions. So people actually have access to you or one of your partners personally. Do you have yes. partners by the way? Yes, yeah, we have mm -hmm. uh, four different coaches over at the program and they range in specialties and experience levels and backgrounds. And so it's really a, a really great team. Um, and then again, between the four of us, we, we were able to put our heads together. if We haven't done something specifically and reach out to someone and, and try to point someone in the right direction. Right. So could you just give an example of some of the topics that are covered? Oh, absolutely. So one of the, I think my favorites is real estate analysis and investment mm -hmm. analysis. So I think a lot of people will look at a mortgage statement and say, okay, well, my, my principal and interest taxes and insurance is $600. I'm renting the property for a thousand. So that means I make $400, right? And I have to say, well, let's take a step back. There's still a lot of other expenses that go into the fold that we want to be accounting for, like vacancy and CapEx and repair and maintenance and management and turn reserves. And so I think just shedding light on how to think about real estate investment analysis as a whole gives people the tools to be able to go out and then do it on their own, which is really the goal that we're, we're looking to achieve. Right, right. Oh, gosh. I could just see you saying that's ever so gently. Well, no. <laughs> there might be Thank a few you. other expenses that come up. <laughs> I, I like to, that kind of a coach. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So it's funny. I used to work as a, a professional fire protection engineer. I did uh -huh. consulting. And so delivering bad news was something that I oh, got very accustomed to. You got very good at. <laughs> yeah. So I, I definitely like to pride myself on that. Oh, yes. And then there's also a marketplace where you share investment opportunities. Yes. Yeah, so Roofstock really at its inception was designed to democratize real estate investing. 
and give people access to real estate investments that they might not ordinarily have uh, either in, in their own personal sphere or in their backyard. And so you can think of it almost like the eBay of real estate investments. So anyone can go online right now to roofstock.com for free and look at investment opportunities around the country. And you'll be able to see what the price is, if it's currently rented, it might have a pre-inspection report, a title survey, as well as some uh, preliminary underwriting that Roofstock has done to give you an idea of, okay, well, if I spend this much money at this, at this interest rate, which are all manipulatable and customizable, this is what my return profile and return metrics look like. Well, that's a great service. Now, is that something that you have to pay for or just sign up for? How does that work? No, nope. yeah. So anyone can go online and look at listings. Just make an account. We're not going to spam you. It's totally free, and so uh, that's that's how you'll get access to, to all of our listings. That's great. So you started out in the Cincinnati, Ohio area, but are you broader now across the country? Yeah. So it's funny. I that's actually where I ended up after spreading myself kind of shotgun across the country. And oh, so I see. Mm -hmm. That's where I got really laser focused, and that's where the vast majority of my portfolio is. Uh, but have recently scaled out into the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, doing some short-term rental stuff as well. Wow, the Smoky Mountains, Tennessee, that looks so very beautiful. I know. Give me the inside track. Is that a good place to invest? <laughs> you know, I think it is. It's it's a mm -hmm. totally different animal and different asset class being short-term rental than, than the traditional long-term rental. So it's something that I'm still getting very much acquainted with. But I'm a I'm very bullish on the market. I'm a big believer in short term rentals in that market in particular, uh, and so I think it's a great asset class and a great place to invest. Oh, nice to know. Now I also read online um, when I was doing my research that you and your wife traveled around in a converted van while you did your business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I left my corporate job in engineering back in 2019, and my wife and I were traveling around the world. Uh, had a I lost my father, unfortunately, due to cancer, so I wanted to go do kind of a hard reset. So we were traveling internationally, and uh, that's when COVID hit was March 2020, April 2020. So we woke up in, in Lisbon and to text and voicemails like, get home now, the borders are closing. So we came oh. home, and we, we had bought a condo previously to be our primary residence, moved into that, realized we weren't quite done getting our wiggles out, and we wanted to travel more, but wanted to to do it in the safest way as possible. So got bought a van, had it converted. And so we were living in that full time for like eight months, nine months, traveling around mostly the Western US. And I was still recording podcasts for Roofstock. I was still doing my coaching uh, with Roofstock and continuing to purchase investment properties along the way as well. So wow. yeah, we just needed a Wi-Fi connection and a cell phone connection, which we had built into the van to help make that a little bit easier for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were just business as usual, but happened to be sleeping in, in different locations every night. Well, and the nice thing about a van, you know, not being too big, you could probably go to some remote areas as long as when you were recording, you had the, you know, access to some good Wi-Fi. Yes. Yeah. We were able to get into some really cool locations. My wife makes fun of me all the time. It seems like we'll be pulling into where we're ready to sleep around 10 p.m., and for whatever reason, my decision-making cognition goes like through the floor. She's like, where are we going? So she <laughs> says, you know, I've got to be sitting up there navigating you after 10 p.m. if we're finding somewhere to sleep. Um, but yeah, we were able to go to some really amazing locations and some really cool national parks. Well, what an adventure. Now, did you tow a car too? I'm getting a little off track from real estate, but this so interests me that uh, you were able yeah. to do this business on the road. Were you pulling a car at the same time? No, we weren't. So okay. our van, it's, we actually just got measured because we were just up on a ferry going to Vancouver Island in, in Canada. So I'm 20.7 feet long, which is what I figured out. So I'm not super long. Mm -hmm. uh, and the van itself is super easy to drive. It basically drives like a U-Haul. And so mm -hmm. we said, you know, we don't really want to tow a car everywhere we go. So let's just drive this thing around. In hindsight, in retrospect, if we were to do it again, towing a car might be a way to go, but I think mm -hmm. we'll probably get e-bikes. That's what we met a lot of people oh, on the road that we're doing. Right, Just right. for zipping around town, mm -hmm. save gas. So I think that's so the way to go. interesting. And you even bought some investment property along the way. You said, were there, were there places that you were not familiar with that you fell in love with and you thought this would just be great? Y you know what? Yes. Uh, we didn't end up purchasing investment property there, but in several of the places we went to, we seriously considered it and looked. Because uh, mm -hmm. as, as most real estate investors, I'm sure would agree, anytime you're in a new place, 
you always kind of got your head on a swivel. You're looking around, checking Zillow out, seeing what things go for and what they rent for. So we definitely had numerous conversations uh, with realtors and went and looked at properties and again, didn't make any decisions uh, or pull the trigger on anything that we actually saw for new markets, but we were investing in markets that we already knew previously. But I definitely have our eyes set on some some new markets because of that oh, trip. Very, very fun. So what advice would you give to someone maybe they're in their 20s or early 30s? Um, they live in an expensive area, you know, one of the coasts. And they don't see any hope for themselves, even if they're making six figures. They don't see how they're ever, ever, ever going to be able to purchase their first home. Would you encourage them to leave the area themselves or just look for investments out of the area? What advice would you give to those young people? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a great question. And it's one that I think so many people are struggling with right now. It can go a number of different directions, which is why I think real estate investing is such a great vehicle is because there's so many different opportunities to, to make the numbers work. So first and foremost, I would say if you are in love with where you're physically living, consider house hacking. And so mm -hmm. what that is, for anyone that's not familiar, is buying a property that's bigger than you need and renting out the extra space or units. And so maybe if you're a single person, look at getting a multiple bedroom house or a duplex or a triplex or a quad because you'll still get that owner occupant rate financing and maybe offsetting those expenses with the other rentals will, will make up for the difference. And that's what, frankly, my wife and I are doing currently is we said, you know what, this is a really expensive market where we bought our house. So we bought a duplex, we bought a house hack and we rent out the upstairs, which significantly offsets our mortgage. So that's first and foremost, something to think about. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you could think about physically moving. If you're not tied to where you're living because your job is remote or you're thinking about making a career change or a job change, anyhow, think about living in a less expensive market. I think that there are a lot of opportunities out there for people uh, in other markets that just might make more sense and might be a really fun place to live. I've heard of a ton of different markets out there that just have a much more uh, a better cost of living that become much more affordable. And so physically move yourself. And mm -hmm. if that's not an option or doesn't sound appealing to you, thirdly, I would say absolutely consider investing in, in one of those markets. You don't have to go live there. You don't even have to go visit. You can invest remotely, and start getting a return on your dollars that are sitting in the bank or sitting in wherever they are and start building equity in investment real estate. And maybe that's the thing that propels you to be able to afford your down payment in your expensive market. And that's really what we did is we were leveraging properties in other markets to be able to get into our primary residence. And so I yeah. think, you know, any of those three options or a combination of them uh, could make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Right. Great advice. And now how do people find you? You know, how do they find out about you and your business? Yeah. So you can come check me out at roofstockacademy.com. Uh, I'm also fairly active on social media. So I'm on LinkedIn, Michael Albom, or also on Twitter. At, at Michael Album. And tell me a little bit about your podcast, The Remote Real Estate Investor. Yeah, so we saw that there were so many great real estate podcasts out there, but we didn't find any that were really specific talking to the pain points of people who are doing this remotely. So investing somewhere other than where they live. And so that's what really where we wanted to shine and carve out a niche for ourselves. So we interview folks, investors, professionals in the industry about real estate investing, but specifically about doing it remotely. And so talk about how can others get involved, what tools and resources can they leverage uh, to do it themselves as well. well I'm going to have to tune into that. That really sounds so very fascinating. And I interview people a lot on this show, and I haven't heard of anyone doing a podcast that focuses on investing remotely. So I think that you found a pretty cool niche. Right on. It's working. I love it. Yeah. Now, there's something um, that I don't know about, so I'm hoping you can explain it to me. In the intro, we talked about NN and NNN leased buildings that you've invested in. And yeah. I, I'm ashamed to say I don't know what that is. No, you should never be ashamed. So I'm so glad you're admitting that. So I am admitting it. Yeah. It stands for double net and triple net lease properties. And what that is, it also refers to as net, net, or net, net, net. They literally say the double or triple nets. And it's where the tenant is responsible for a lot of the stuff that a landlord is typically responsible for. And so what I mean by that is in a triple net lease, you'll often see them advertised. And these are commercial properties. So you'll have a commercial tenant. It's not for residential, um, typically. 
I know someone's going to find an example and be like, no, 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 I found an example. <laughs> but traditionally, they're commercial leases. Typically. Mm-hmm. And it's where the tenant will pay the property taxes. The tenant will pay the insurance. The tenant will pay for building maintenance and often upgrades, specific upgrades at specific intervals. And so like McDonald's and CVS and Walgreens, a lot of these really big national chains are tenants. They don't own the physical properties that they're occupying. They will lease them often on a triple net lease. And so it really gives the tenant a lot more control, but what, how they have to control the building and how they have to operate it is all spelled out in the lease. And so when people talk about passive investing or mailbox money, when you're participating in direct ownership, I would argue that triple net leases are like the epitome of passive real estate investing once the property is owned. There's a lot of due diligence. It can be very expensive to, to operate, or excuse me, to, to purchase because of that due diligence. But again, I would argue that if you are direct ownership, you're not investing in someone else's deal, you're owning the building directly uh, or via some kind of entity, it's about as passive as it can get. Wow. Are those kinds of um, deals difficult to find or are they very common in commercial real estate? You know, they are quite common in commercial real estate. And everybody makes the joke that loopnet.com is like where good deals go to die. But oh. I've picked up some great deals fr- from that website. And I think if people are interested, that's a great place to go get started and just to see what's out there. You'll see Burger Kings and Shake Shacks and Taco Bells and Bryson stores and medical buildings. Like all of these types of tenants uh, could, could operate within a triple net or double net lease type of scenario. So I would encourage people to go check that out if that's something that they're interested in. Now, of course, there's a trade off. Because it sounds great. The tenant's paying for all the repairs and maintenance and taxes and insurance. So what am I giving up in return? And that's typically going to be the the return itself. So when you calculate the cap rate or the cash on cash return, that tends to be not as attractive as some other investment opportunities out there. But it tends to be a little bit less of a risky investment and less, less management intensive as well. Wow, a lot to learn. Do you get into on your academy some of the tax loopholes that uh, realtors or people investing can take advantage of? Yeah, we do. So we talk about some of the really well-known tax strategies. Um, We've had numerous CPAs on the podcast. And so we talk about all that stuff. Uh, We do some group coaching where we get down into some small groups and talk about the nitty gritty and we'll have guests, mostly CPAs, come on and talk about the specific loopholes. Absolutely. Well, how fun. Is your wife involved in the business as well, or is she doing her own thing? She is, yeah. So she was working remote for a long time uh, in the e-learning space, doing something totally unrelated, but definitely helps us manage our own personal portfolio. And and she recently actually left her job and is going to get her real estate license. And so she'll be working as a realtor here locally in our market as well. Well, that'll be very fun for you to work together. Yeah, we're really excited. Well, you've shared such wonderful information today. Is there something that I didn't ask you that you'd like to share before I ask you for your contact information? No, Patty, I think this has been super great. Uh, Thank you so much for for having me on again. Oh, gosh. Thank you. I'm so very impressed with how you got started, being willing to move out of an expensive area, the house hacking, all the tips you gave. Just give people a great way to get started. And then a few years down the line, you're just going to be um, sitting back on easy street. That's the hope. That's the (laughs) hope. Yeah. Now, if people have listened and they want to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Yeah, best place is on uh, either LinkedIn or Twitter. And so that's at Michael Albaum on Twitter uh, and LinkedIn as well. I try to be really responsive to folks. So would love to hear from any of your listeners. Mm, Sounds great. Well, I can't thank you enough for being an icon on our Icons of Real Estate podcast today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Patty. Take care. 